As we begin our thoughts on the Scriptures this morning, we want to go back uh, a little bit earlier in the chapter, uh, as we have just read the final verses this morning. And uh, particularly, I want you to look at verse 10. And uh, you will recall having uh, gone through the chapter at some depth over the last number of Sunday mornings, we have been encouraged as it opens with uh, the assembly of the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes and all the key leaders and, and figures and then any of the others who wanted to, to join in with that, they witnessed the transportation of the Ark of the Covenant into the temple, newly built and uh, just about to be dedicated. So there is the understanding that the house of God must be seen to be the dwelling place of God. There has to be the evidence that God is there among his people. And so the ark of the covenant, which has been uh, filled that role uh, through the life of the tabernacle when the people of Israel were nomadic in their lifestyle, must now be assembled and put in what the Bible refers to as its proper place in the temple. And as that has been secured, we read then in uh, verse 10, it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. And so in the beginning, as it were, of their public ministry in this newly built and completed temple, right at the commencement of this new, fresh ministry, the glory of God comes in such a way that in verse 11 we read, so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So, right at the commencement, there is a degree of confusion. How will they dare to continue? How can they engage in public worship in this place, this house of God, where the glory of God has so filled the house that uh, the people of Israel are overwrought because of the condition of their heart and the glory and the holiness of God. But in the last number of studies, you will note that we have gone through the words that the king, King Solomon, has shared with his people. Uh, initially, uh, before he uh, engages in the actual dedication of the temple, he addresses the people, he prepares them in mind and in heart, and then the bulk of the official ceremony is handed over to public prayer. King Solomon leads the people in prayer. After engaging in prayer and approaching God through their worship, we now come this morning to the final part, which is in fact a celebration of all that it means to be the people of God. A people who are now in a position to enjoy unbroken fellowship with God based upon His promise to them and their reliance upon his will. And so, at the end of the chapter, we see a fitting conclusion to end the confusion. Now, I'm sure that this particular message could be altered in a variety of ways, 
as we look around and address the confusion that is to be found in so many of our churches today. And if we would all take heed to the final verses of this chapter, we would recognize that there's no need for confusion in the house of God uh, if we are prepared to follow the instructions of His Word. And we want to just discover some of those truths in our thoughts this morning. Now, the prayer of Solomon that uh, forms the major part of this chapter and divides up into a number of sections deals primarily and uh, fundamentally with two features. There are two main features of the prayer. The first one becomes very obvious as we read through the prayer, where King Solomon focuses upon his concern with Israel's fickle practice. That is, how they have shown in so many areas and in so many ways a disregard for the revealed will of God for the nation. They have not walked in obedience to his will. We only need to go back into the early chapters and see the revolt when they try to overthrow the throne of David and put a usurper on the throne in place of the promised Solomon. Uh, the, the pinnacle of their rebellion against God. And so, the main part of the prayer focuses on this sad reality. Israel's fickle practice. The second feature of the prayer, however, reveals his confidence in Jehovah's faithful promise. So, on the one hand, we have the concern over the fickle nature of the obedience to God's Word as exhibited in the life of the nation. And yet, on the other hand, we are drawn to recognize the promises of God which, in spite of our waywardness, remain sure and solid and faithful. God cannot deny his promise. And therefore, this becomes the encouragement of the heart of the king as he leads the nation in prayer. Now, notice King Solomon reveals the fact that he is acutely aware of God's consistent promises and faithfulness over the years. We sang in our opening hymn this morning that, uh, that lovely hymn, Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And no doubt if we had the opportunity and the time and our memory allowed us to, we could go back over many, many years and declare the faithfulness of God as he has honored his promises in our lives individually and personally. Look at how King Solomon draws this out. Come with me to verse 20 of First Kings chapter 8. So the Lord has fulfilled his word which he spoke. And I have filled the position of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. God is faithful to his promise. Then look at verse 56. Coming down to the end of the chapter. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he has promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised through his servant Moses. 
So in spite of the fickle nature of their obedience, in spite of their lack of conformity to his will, God has not, he will not, he cannot forsake his people, for he has pledged in covenant promise his faithfulness in upholding his word within their heart. <clears throat> now, this is, of course, the only ground upon which Solomon can now approach Jehovah. This is the only ground upon which he can stand or his people can stand before a holy God. Come into verse 26 of 1 Kings uh, chapter 8. <clears throat> and now I pray, O God of Israel, let your word come true, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. What is the ground upon which we stand as the people of God when we come before God in prayer? The only ground upon which we stand is the promise of God. Everything we receive has come from His hand and is the result of His faithful promise. You look here into the experience of King Solomon and the people of Israel. He could not plead Israel's obedience to God's law. For they had broken it time after time after time. He could not he could not bring into his prayer the uh, devotion and the worship of his people. That was something lacking, something that had failed over the years. Nor could he plead commitment to the righteous outworking of God's purpose in um, in their heart. And so his confidence uh, is built into, rests upon, is developed in and through the very commitment of God in his promise to his people. That is his ability and willingness to forgive, his ability and willingness to protect and fortify his people. So, now, let's take a moment to notice the formula that's adopted by King Solomon. You'll see in the prayer, which we have already looked at briefly in our study last uh, weekend, that there is a particular formula that is adopted by King Solomon. He begins the petition with the word, when. And in doing this, he is in reality spreading the need. He concludes the prayer by introducing the word then. And while the when spreads the need, then supplies the plead. So he is coming on the basis of the reality that there is a need. And when that need is uh, spread before the Lord, then there is the confidence that God will come and minister to his people in that particular time of need. Now, just a glance through. We won't take the time to examine it in detail. But look at verse 31 and 32, for example. When anyone sins, 32, then here in heaven. Verse 33, when your people Israel are defeated, 34, then here in heaven. And this is the pattern or the formula that continues down through uh, to the last petition in verse 49. There are nine petitions in total, all of which 
carry out this particular formula. So King Solomon is not only acknowledging the sins of the past and the sins of the people present, but he is also acknowledging the strong possibility that these sins will be repeated in the future. So the thought is, when they sinned in the past, when they sin in the present, and when they sin in the future, then hear and answer their prayer for forgiveness. The prayer for their forgiveness is based upon three things. Look at verse 47. Yet when they come to themselves in the land where they were carried captive, and repent, and make supplication to you in the land of those who took them captive, saying, We have sinned and done wrong. We have committed wickedness. Notice the three things. One, they come to them Selves. What does that mean? Well, remember the prodigal son. It was the fact that sitting amongst the swine in the foreign country, far from the father's house, he came to himself. And then he began to act accordingly. You and I must come to that sense of our own unworthiness, the sense of our sinfulness, And the second thing is repentance. We turn from our sin, and uh, then we plead the mercy of God, made supplication. Now, what does 1 John 1, 9 tell us? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all on righteousness. Now here in um, verse 59 of um, 1 Kings chapter 8, notice how King Solomon now addresses the people. He instructs them on how and why he has prayed in this fashion for them. May these words of mine, with which I have made supplication before the Lord, be near the Lord our God day and night, that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel, as each day may require. So this is the purpose of the prayer. One, that God will be honored in the worship of his people, in the temple. But secondly, that God may be worshipped in the life of his people as they go about their normal routine within the kingdom of Israel. After the prayer... Coming down into verses 65 and 66, you will notice that they conclude the activities around the opening of the temple with a time of celebration. Now, before we come into the celebration, there are three things that we need to to note, and you'll find them listed in verses 62 through to 64. Introduced by this comment, Then the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. The nature of these offerings or sacrifices is uh, threefold. And uh, you'll find them mentioned there or outlined in uh, the next two 
verses, verse 63 and 64. These were conducted in the outer court, that is, just uh, prior to entry into the temple, the open courtyard, which is often referred to in the New Testament. Uh, the area was um, dedicated, sanctified, set apart, and it was here the people assembled and at this spot the offerings are now made. Now you will see that they had to do this because of the nature and the number of the worshippers, and also because of the necessity to include the slaughter of animals as a part of the ceremony. And so in verse 63 we're told there were offered on that occasion 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. Now, we won't get into the um, procedures nor into the particular outcomes of all of that, but you can imagine just how lengthy a process that would have been and how many would have been engaged in a hands-on exercise of the ministry on that occasion. But let me just point out to you the three offerings that were made. First of all, in verse 63, Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to the Lord. The peace offering was a shared offering. That simply meant that part of it was offered up to God, and that would have been consumed uh, by the fire of the altar. Part of it was taken by the priest and used for his own uh, benefit, and that was mainly the breast and the right thigh, and part was taken by the worshippers. And you'll see in verse 65, and the first part of the verse, that time Solomon held a feast. So a part of this peace offering would be given to the feast, and the worshippers would uh, participate. Uh, if you go over to Leviticus chapter 7, which uh, you, you can do that, but we won't, we won't read through for the sake of time this morning, you'll see there that this whole process is clearly identified and uh, it, it is set out uh, in the nature which we have just described. Now, if... Uh, we were to go over into Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20, you'll find the New Testament explanation and confirmation of this particular uh, offering. Colossians chapter 1, uh, we'll read verse 19 and, and then verse 20. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, that is, in Christ. We have uh, been told uh, that in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and we are complete in him. So here now we read Colossians 1, verse 19, It pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So the sacrifice or the offering of the peace offering was a symbol or a type 
of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary, who through the shedding of his blood brings peace, not only into the world, but into the heart of those who believe. So this is a shared offering. Offered to God, the priest is involved and the people receive the benefit. Now the second offering is recorded in verse 64 of 1 Kings chapter 8. On the same day, the king consecrated the middle of the court that was in front of the house of the Lord, for there he offered burnt offerings, grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offerings, because the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat of the peace Offering. So here we have the second offering, being the burnt offerings. Now the burnt offerings represented complete dedication to God. Young lamb or bull or goat, turtle doves or even young pigeons could be used. But if you read Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3 to 17, you'll see that the specified preparation and performance of the offering required that only the purest of the pure could be used in uh, the sacrifice. Now, come with me over to the book of Hebrews the book of Hebrews, and we'll read a few verses from chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Look at verse 18 and 19. For on the one hand there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. Let me just read that again. The law made nothing perfect. Now, you may be trying to get to heaven through the law, You may believe with all your heart and trust with all your being that simply by observing God's law and being religiously righteous that you will get to heaven. But the Bible tells us not that defiles will enter in. We're told if we break one small part of the law, we become guilty of all. Why? Because the law cannot make anyone perfect. We will never get to heaven simply through observing the law, no matter how close to perfection we may feel we are able to be brought. The law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. There is a better way. There is a more perfect way. There is a way that can make the worshiper perfect outside of themselves a perfection that comes from a finished work that God has initiated, and God controls, and God performs in the heart and life. Now come down to verse 23. We're still in Hebrews 7. Also there were many priests. 
many priests because um, they were trying to bring the people into a condition of perfection and that required a lot of priests to do it. And even then they could not succeed. There were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, that is, Christ, he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is able also to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. So, the burnt offering required a perfect sacrifice. And here Jesus now appears. Come over into Hebrews chapter 9. And let's read verse 11 through to 14. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot, without blemish, without defilement, offered himself to God. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And then note what Peter adds in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. We are redeemed, he records, not with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but those who are redeemed of the Lord, those who are saved by His grace, are redeemed, look at verse 19, with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Christ is our burnt offering. He died as the lamb acceptable to God, pure, holy, undefiled. And he died in the place of sinners. And so the offering speaks of uh, dedication. It's interesting to note that it was the turtle doves which were appropriate in this particular offering that Joseph and Mary brought to the temple when Jesus was eight days old. Now the other thought uh, comes in uh, that 64th verse of 1 Kings chapter 8 again and lists the third and final offering, uh, the grain offering. And uh, you'll find the grain offering is set out in Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. So Leviticus 1 and 2 
give us these offerings in detail. And you can go back and look through those at your leisure. But uh, this was referred to as a bloodless offering in that it did not require the shedding of blood. It did not involve the slaughter or the sacrifice of an animal. It was a bloodless offering. And that's because it was the offering of the harvest. It was a recognition of thankfulness for what God had provided uh, throughout the year. There was the first fruits. That was a special worship activity. Uh, But the harvest was reaped at various stages through the year as various crops were gathered in. And so uh, the offering of uh, the grain uh, was one that was performed at various stages. And it represented the goodness of God on the one hand, in providing the harvest, and then the thanks of the people, the thanksgiving of the people in response to the provisions of God. And so we see in these three offerings, one, reconciliation. The first, the peace offering, speaks of communion and fellowship with God acceptance before a holy God. The second uh, speaks of dedication or submission, the burnt offering. That is, the people coming to willingly submit to the rule of God, to bow to his sovereign authority and power. Just as the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, when he rose and said, Lord, what will you have me to do? The third then, the grain offering, speaks of thanksgiving and appreciation. So how do we give our thanks to the Lord? Is it only before his altar in the Lord's house? Is it only when we come together for worship? What did David say? How shall I render thanks unto the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will take the cup of his salvation. How do we take the cup of his salvation? We take it every day. We rejoice in his grace, his saving merit, and we commit to live for his glory, walking worthy of our high and holy calling. And so these offerings are now followed with celebration. Verse 65 and 66. So even though the cloud has come down and filled the temple, and the people gather in the outer court. Here now is the recognition that God has come down to dwell among them, to be their God, to lead and guide and direct them in the routine of their lives, in the building of the kingdom. And all that he has promised, he will perform. He will fulfill the obligations of his covenant. And so as the people rejoice and celebrate, they leave to make their journey home with the words of verse 61 ringing in their ear and reverberating in their heart. Let your heart therefore be loyal to the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as at this day. That ought to be the challenge for our hearts this morning. Let us bow in prayer. Our 
Our loving Father, we thank you for this time well spent in your presence here today. We thank you for your word and pray that by its truth we will walk in our witness before our neighbors and family and friends so that we will engage in the receiving of the benefits of your promise. Help us to be obedient and walk worthy of your calling upon our lives. Help us to recognize that in the peace offering, we have fellowship with God. In the burnt offerings, we are able to dedicate ourselves to your cause. And in the grain offerings, we continue to render thanks and praise and worship, not only as we come to the house of the Lord, but as we engage in the daily demands of our lives. Help us, therefore, Lord, to demonstrate our love for you through obedience to your word. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.